Hello, welcome to season four, episode three of Hashtag Psychotherapy Unfolded. As you know, I'm psychotherapist and relationship counsellor Mark Fielding and your host. Um, music therapy is such um, an important arm of the therapy world that it's really shocking that we've not had a musical ther- a music therapist on, you know, for you know any of the previous three seasons. But we correct that today. Uh, and I'd like to introduce our guest, Bob Heath. Uh, music therapist, clinical supervisor, author, teacher and musician. Um, Bob has been a music therapist for 20 years and for many years worked extensively in palliative and bereavement care in the NHS. He teaches creative therapeutic um, uh, strategies at universities in the UK, Italy and Romania. He has written chapters and articles for a wide range of books and journals and recently published his first book, Songs from a Window, End of Life Stories from the Music Therapy Room, uh, which I, I, I read yesterday and loved. And we will reference the book a lot kind of going forwards. So I just want to say thank you so much for, for coming on the show, Bob. Thank you, Mark. It's really nice to be here. I mean, could we kick off? I, I generally kick off and I ask our guests around their personal experiences and obviously share as much or as little as you're happy with that led them into the field. Um, I mean, with, you know, I mean, looking back, you know, what were the personal mm. experiences that you had in life that led you to work in this field? Uh, I think one of the strongest memories I have is, is, well, there's one very personal one, which is being a young kid in a choir and singing in a choir. I was, you know, Royal School of Church Music kind of thing. I grew up in Stoke-on-Trent and there was a very big choir at one of the churches there. And I was a member of it. And um, this is in the 60s. And, you know, I was kind of into the Beatles and the Stones, but I loved the choir. And I can remember from time to time um, doing big services where the, the, the all the choir was there. And sometimes the music would just, um, it would almost overwhelm me. I, I couldn't sing. I'd be so emotional. And this is like a nine, ten-year-old boy. So I, I had a deep connection with something about music, whether it was the spiritual nature of music or the power of sound. Yeah. That always stayed with me. And then when I uh, I started to actually flirt with the music industry as a teenager and got, you know, offered deals and, and worked with record companies and stuff, I soon became very, very aware that I was becoming an arch saboteur. Um, I There was something about the music industry that I didn't like at all. Mm. Um, so I loved writing. And music and I love performing and love singing um but there was a there was a disconnect for me and I didn't really understand it it was very frustrating um but I think without wanting to sound too precious about it I think my relationship with music was so it mattered so much to me mm-hmm. and I, it needed to have meaning and um and so it was, you know, I I was in and out of the music industry for many years, and um, and then I was I was given an opportunity to work in a special school. Uh, in those days, they used to we used to have schools that were called uh, PMLD schools, and they were simply just for young people with profound and multiple learning difficulties. And um, my my job there was to try and just use music in any way to communicate with young people who certainly couldn't, they had no formal language, um, they couldn't hold instruments. um, They uh, were were often, you know, quadriplegic, um, often blind. And so it was the tiniest musical gestures that you could make um, that would hopefully become part of some form of communication. And, Mm. And it was the first time in my life, really, I think, where I went, oh, I kind of, this is this is where I belong. This is where I'm using music and I'm making music up. I'm writing it, if you like. I'm creating something, and um, and in doing so, I'm forming relationships with people in in a different kind of way. And it was so exciting. And that then led me into uh, deciding to train as a as a music therapist. Yeah, and I'd, I mean, I've I've worked with kind of adults with learning difficulties, which is slightly different. And yeah, and there was a we had a music therapist kind of in the company, and goodness me, I mean, it's so amazing, especially for mm. you know, sort of for, just as you say, you know, people that maybe you know are 
can't communicate you know that you know as we communicate with words and stuff and you know, music i think in the book in your book you said something around music really connects in a deep way and i guess that mm. is what you're doing i mean could, could just for our listeners what what is music therapy good question <laughs> it's a very wide question i know it but... is a, it is yeah <laughs> yeah well um i i think sort of clinically it would be described as as um the application of uh, music and the uh, the essential features of music um, uh, in psychological and emotional uh, and physical uh, ways to aid the suffering of of clients, patients. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, in a more human kind of description, um, it's. As human beings, we all have a very unique relationship with music, and we know that music yeah. operates at all of those levels. It operates uh, very physically uh, with us, and and also emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. Yeah. And what we do as music therapists is we try to use the elements of music to connect in those different ways, uh, in order to um, uh, offer people opportunities to um, perhaps. Um, express themselves in in new yeah. and helpful ways. Um, often, to find um, language to say things that have felt unsayable. Yeah. Um, we use music as audio analgesia. You know, it it it. There are you know proven um, sort of well documented pieces of research which demonstrate you know the reduction of the use of analgesia in operating yeah. theatres when music is used effectively. Yeah. It, I think the thing about music therapy that the, the the most helpful thing to remember is that it none of it really is about doing music at people. Almost all of it is about doing something musical with people. So it's it's engaging in a relationship with someone mm-hmm. where music is one of the essential parts of that relationship. Yeah, and, and and I guess it, it is. I mean, I'm I'm kind of linking into the songwriting element of mm-hmm. it, and I know that's a big part, you know, of of the way you work. And could you say a little bit more uh, around that, around the songwriting, and you know how you use that with clients? Yeah, um, it 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 goes back. I, I mean, it, we can't really. I don't think we've ever identified societies going right back, you know, um, in our histories that haven't seemed to have used this kind of unique combination of music and words in some way. Definitely. And if you think about, yeah. you know, imagine a world without songs, it just couldn't work. You know, they're there yeah. for pretty well every every event of our lives. And mm. they we use them to form our groups, our gangs, our societies. Yeah, to, absolutely. And, and to mark every important occasion. Um, when I trained... Um, I was on a placement at a residential mental health unit and I had a client who, she was a young woman who had attempted suicide on a number of occasions. And when she came to me, she, she for her first session, she would bring recordings of death metal and she'd, I'd sit and listen to them with her and she'd say, that's me, that, that's who I am, that's, that's what, that's what yeah. my life's like. Yeah. And I... And if I'm honest, I, I didn't know what to do other than to say, I, you know, thanks for sharing this. But I wonder if if you were to write your own version of that, would you be saying the same things? Mm. And it took me a little while to convince her. But she began with a bit of help just by tapping on a little drum with me. And she began to create her own words and music and ended up writing a song called Could I Come Away Staying? She discovered through the process that she perhaps wanted to live a little bit more than she'd yeah. previously been expressing. And so um, it became quite clear to me anyway, for my own practice, that songwriting really worked. And of course, because I'd been a songwriter since I was 10, 11 years old, it was something I was very familiar with. Um, and um, and so I just went on to, to use it more and, I think particularly in uh, where I spent so much time working in end of life care. Yeah. And um, it made so much sense because we kind of in palliative care most of our referrals are are people who 
uh, a, a treatment has ended. And so we meet them at the time when they perhaps feel the most hopeless. Yeah. You know, that there's there's no more chemo, there's no more this. And, and now they're they're in this period of whatever it might be, a few months uh, before they die. And the job is to kind of help them to re-engage with hope, but perhaps in a different kind of way. Yeah. We hope for different things. We hope for things about around our families and uh, our legacies. Perhaps we hope to heal wounds, whatever it might be that we do. And, um, and of course, music is such a wonderful way of beginning to just enter into that uh, uh, in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in a way that perhaps um, can feel um, safe, you know, yeah. But but when we start to introduce the idea of songwriting, I always see it as, as a way of sort of saying to my clients, well, look, let's just put our arms around all of this. Imagine a song does that. So you can put anything in here. Mm. You can tell the truth. You can tell lies. You can contradict yourself. You can do all of the things that you might need to do in order to be able to express what it is that you need to express. Yeah. And the song can hold it. And, um, and so... Uh, yeah, I began to use it more and more often. And of course, many people have created legacies with it. Um, yeah, uh, gifts to leave behind for their families. Yeah, yeah. But for many people, I think it's it's it becomes that opportunity to tell the truth in a different yeah. kind of way. And and what such, you? yeah. Sorry, Bob. Go on. No, no. Carry on. Yeah, no. I, I was going to say. I mean, it's such an important space. I think for you know anyone kind of engaging in music therapy but for people that you know at their, at their end of their lives mm. i mean providing that space goodness me it must be i mean it, it must be so intimate bob i mean obviously you have to be boundaried as a therapist but you do yeah you do i i, I often wonder if uh certainly for music therapists and i imagine this might be true for all of us um that in palliative care we, we perhaps need to be at our most flexible. Yeah, yeah, you I know? absolutely see that, yeah. Um, uh, I'm a huge devotee of Irvin Yalom, and of course, uh, Yalom writes so much about death and dying, yeah. um, very honestly. And of course, it, it it appears in many of his case studies, uh, death anxiety, the fear of dying, yeah. and and the way he contextualises that in his work. You know, it's, it's so important. And... Um, I think what I learned was that, um, uh, yes, w I needed to be boundaried in my work. I needed, because my clients needed, I, you know, my clients need, like yours, I think they they need to come to us and know that they can't destroy us. You know, yeah, it, talking about death and dying, you know, often uh, clients would say to me, I, I come and see you and I tell you all this stuff because, I just feel like you can take it. Kind of yeah. a weird thing, isn't it? And you sit there and think, well, I sort of like that and I don't. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. you know, I like it because obviously I'm hopefully I'm I'm being a bit helpful. Mm. And but I am really feeling all of this too. Yes. But I'm containing it and holding it because that's yeah. my job and and that's what you need. Mm. Um so yeah. And of course in palliative care, every client that we meet, unless it's a bereavement client. The, the given is that okay well we meet for the first time and we do know that well while both of us are dying uh you are probably going to be doing it much sooner than me so yeah, yeah. what do we need to do you know yeah and, be and i guess reading the reading the book you know i mean your you know i mean fondness is probably an understatement but i mean your your, your connection with the clients that you, you need to talk about in your book is is so obviously such a deep one and and i and i guess there's a few instances with certain clients that you work with in the book where they passed away almost i mean they're, they're, they're terminally but almost unexpectedly mm. you know you were left kind of wanting the next session wanting to connect mm. and i just wanted to ask i mean how, how do you deal with the loss because i mean you really connect with the clients i mean that's clear to say and of course you would i mean this is why you know you, you're in this profession but how how do you deal with with the, the the kind of constant losses really of people that you care about 
Well, uh, we all know about accumulated grief, don't we? And we all know about the potential toxic nature of our work. Yeah. We all go to supervision. Yeah. Supervision is, is absolutely crucial. I was incredibly lucky. Yeah. I had a psychotherapist as my supervisor for 20 years. In fact, I dedicated the book to him. He died. Um, and he was just so profoundly helpful. Um, uh, he was really tough. Yeah. And, um, yeah, he, he wasn't frightened to remind me that, you know, uh, that sometimes I would show up at supervision almost wearing death on my shoulder. Yeah. And he'd say, you know, you, well, you need to know this. You need to do something with this. Mm. Um, because it is, it, it can be quite toxic. Mm. And the work itself, I think I just adore. Yeah. I love it. Um, but, um, yeah, we need to find the space um, and separation from it so that we can yeah. remind ourselves that we belong with the living and uh, yeah. and that and that not everyone is imminently dying. Um, but I also think there's the other uh, part of all of that is, is, I know sometimes it's difficult to have the conversation about loving our clients, but we do, don't we? Yeah. And uh, and so, you know, part of the challenge of working in end of life care is is knowing that you're going to be saying goodbye. Yeah. Um. But of course, in all of that is our role in helping them to die well. Yes. And yeah. so there's often uh, real beauty in in being around people who do the dying really well, who have the opportunity, the time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and to do the things that they need to do to prepare to die well um, and to create the things that they want to create and leave these beautiful things behind them. And so there is something profoundly beautiful about that too, mm -hmm. which um, I think is really helpful. Yeah. And I have to say, you know, I absolutely agree. I mean, you know, arguably I think spending time with somebody at the end of their life is, is really the greatest intimacy. I mean, it really mm. is an honor to be able to spend mm. that time with somebody. And, and and I wonder if, if if I could read something, you fit it, I just want to read a paragraph from your book, which I found yes, really, yeah. really beautiful. If that's okay. Well, yes, of course. Uh, one of the extraordinary things about working in palliative care is that we meet people for whom time frames have become much more visible and clearly defined. The things that we need to do will need to be done now. And the things that we've left unsaid will need to be said. Perhaps the greatest thing that they touch, that they teach us, is that we shouldn't wait until we're dying before we start to share our truth and our stories and write our songs. Um, I, I, I thought that was absolutely mm. beautiful, really. Yeah. And I guess, you know, people at the end of life and I guess everyone has a different experience. But, you know, I guess the present moment becomes so much more important to them because time is limited. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it does. You know, I, um, I I do a bit of voluntary work at the local hospice now. Um, I haven't sort of done any in-depth um, music therapy work with uh, dying patients for a little while. And then I found last week I was in Romania. And I was at a hospice and the doctor said, could I come and visit a, a patient? And he showed me this uh, uh, YouTube video of this gentleman who was quite a famous singer in Romania. He was very active in the communist movement before Ceausescu came down. And then after that, he became a, a big Christian. And, you know, but the, uh, YouTube is full of this man's incredible Romanian folk song singing. And he said, we're going to see him. He has a brain tumor. And he's, He's dying, he's at home with his wife. So I I have my guitar and I step into his bedroom. Um he can't speak. Uh he can't make any vocal sounds anymore now as a result of his tumor. And he's and uh it kind of all came flooding back to me really very, very quickly. It's like that what 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 might I be able to do? What might I offer here? And so I just kind of played a couple of the chords I remembered from listening to his songs as we were driving over there in the car. And it's very sort of easy to play traditional kind of Romanian uh, sort of structures. 
and I just played a few of these chords and and lalaed and eventually just held his hand and he, he cried and there was a picture on the wall which he'd painted it was a painting of his mum carrying wood coming home from the woods mm, wow. so I just sung about the painting in English and the doctor translated the words into Romanian um, and kind of on one level it, it reminded me how simple this is in that we're just making up very simple musical things um, and uh, uh, and just placing him in this little simple vehicle, if you like. But on the other hand, the it, it's it's the deeply human thing that we all connect yeah. with the, that that um, it becomes the way that we can, in a very emotionally connected way, just contain some of our experiences. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was another big lesson. Yeah, and, and it makes me think of, I think it was Eileen in the book, the, the lady that um, was that had dementia, I think, and, mm. and the la, la, la. Yeah. Just, I, I'm asking you to speak about a whole case history, but could you just say a little bit for our listeners uh, about that work? Because I, I was really struck by that. And, you know, the, well, I don't put words in your mouth. Mm. Yeah, when, could you maybe say a bit more? Uh, well, certainly, I mean, music therapy has uh, has a really powerful role in things like dementia because the the, the links between music and memory are, are are becoming more and more and more well known and so you know the uh, the emergence of neurological music therapy uh, is is uh, it, I mean it, it's happening uh, to a great extent because uh, of the you know the amount we're learning about the way that the brain works when it's involved in in connecting with creative yeah. You know the Bessel van der Kolk book, um, uh, The Body Keeps the Score? Yes. That was yeah. so exciting to read that because, yeah. you know, again, using creativity to connect you know, Magdala yeah. and, and the, the bits of the brain that light up when we're being creative. And, yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, so we know that music therapy can help people who've long mm. ago lost their language find their words again. Mm. We get the right song, they find the words. And so, yeah. and that's powerful for them but also wonderful for their families families you know you yeah you can have families witnessing their their, their parents their, their, their loved one um mm. finding language again yeah. um and in their words coming alive again i'm not sure i like that i think mm. but but you know the the idea that, that that this person who they thought had disappeared can re-emerge but with eileen um she would she just sat in the a wheelchair going la 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 and anyone who's worked in dementia be very familiar with the, the, those kind of sounds and it was very early in my career and and i was asked if i could shut her up because she was driving everybody crazy which seemed like a, a strange irony to me um but when i met her i just all i could think was she seemed so absolutely distressed she's so deeply distressed so i took her to a room and um, I, I just went la, la, la with her. You know, I just thought, well, all I can do is let you know I'm hearing you. So she's going la, 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 and I'm just going la, la, la. And then I thought, well, I'll sing it. So I just sang la, 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 la. And all of a sudden, she opened her eyes and she began to sing. And she... And in those days, I used to record all of my sessions by permission because I had to keep taking them back to supervision. Yeah, yeah. And so I had this recording of Eileen just singing this phenomenal, and she just, you know, la, 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 la. It just became this, you know, if you read the book, you can actually go online and listen to the music at the same time. It's available. You don't have to pay for it. And you hear Eileen just doing this phenomenal um, uh, performance. Um, uh, with me just trying to keep up, You're leading me, you can hear her leading me. Uh, and um, she sang for 40 minutes. When I left, I got in the lift and she was still singing. Wow. And I discovered that the following week that I, later that night she, she died. So this became a swan song. And I think, you know, all that I needed was for someone to listen to her, you know. Yeah. Uh, so beautiful uh, thank you yeah um i i think when we're working i it, it, in all of our work isn't it i think what people really need is 
to be heard and the quality of yeah. you know when we listen to people generously they they hear truth in themselves often for the first time yeah. you know, famous right. Anthony Storr quote yeah. and it, it's so true um and so I think that's one of the things that music therapists are acutely attuned to mm. uh, is is this active and and creative listening yeah so we listen very actively to what we're hearing but also try and listen creatively where's the music in that sound and that's mm. all I did with Eileen mm. try to put that in a musical context and then she sees the moment <laughs> but but how wonderful for me for Eileen you know you really you know facilitating her able to express herself in that way you know in a really beautiful way you know right at the end you know of her life I mean they, I, I guess reading the book you know I was just struck by the amount of beauty in it really you know I mean it's yeah, I mean, I was really kind of emotionally affected reading it. You know, I mean, there are so many instances in the book that are absolutely beautiful, really. You know, there was a sadness, of course, because these people are passing mm-hmm. away, but there is some real kind of beauty. Um, I'm kind of moving around a little bit. Um, I just mm-hmm. I wanted to wanted to ask you, Bob, about this is a bit of a segue, but forgive me, about your NDE. I, okay. I really, yeah, I really wanted you to. You wanted me to you. talk publicly about that, do you? <laughs> well, it's in the book. Well, you don't, you don't I have know, to, no, it's, have it's an absolutely it. fair question. Uh, uh, as much or as little as you'd like to share, but it's well, kind no, of something I'm, I'm very, very interested in. <laughs> I am really happy to talk about it. Do you know, when the book came out, I, Therapy Today contacted me, you know, Thresholds, which is the spiritual arm of it. Yeah, yeah. And they said, um, can you write something about your book? And I thought, I don't, I don't know what to write about it. I mean, I've, I've just written the book. And I thought, and then I thought, you know, I suppose one of the things I was worried about, about putting the book out, was the incident that you're referring to when I, I'm with a young client and it, he's, he's 32 years old. He's this incredibly yes. beautiful young Danish man yeah. uh, who'd, uh, just had a, a his first child, a uh, beautiful family, and then he gets this glioblastoma, and he's got ten months to live, and it's shocking, and he's angry, and and then of course he becomes very frightened about dying, and um, and he keeps pushing me, you know. What do you believe? What do you believe? Yeah. And uh, I, 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 you know, I take every evasive measure that we've ever been trying to take, and, <laughs> and a few yeah. more, I make up a few of my own. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I'm determined not to. Anyway, he just he he gets very very angry with me in the end. I said, you know, you you you've asked me to do all of these things. You've got me writing songs. You've got me talking about my family. You've got me doing all of this stuff. You know, you tell me what you think. And so I thought. Um, he became the first client I'd ever told about my NDE. So what happened to me was that when I was 10 years old, 11 years old, I had an operation on my ear um, and um, uh, I had a huge post-operative fit and uh, the hospital found my mum and dad. I'm one of seven children. Um, um, they found my mum and dad and told them that I died, not to rush, um, and it wasn't a panic. There's nothing anyone could do but to come to the hospital. And um, by the time they got to the hospital, my dad didn't even come to the ward. He was he went in search of the surgeon to have a conversation with him. Um, um, but mum came in, and, and I was back. And um, no one told me anything about this, but I do know that I I went to sleep on the Monday night, and I woke up, and it was Wednesday. Mm-hmm. I don't know that. Um, and I was very confused by it. But more than that, I was incredibly aware that something very weird had happened. <laughs> and I'd, um, I had this very clear vision of myself staring at my own body, watching people doing things to me. I'd, I'd flown across the room. I'd flown down the stairs. Yeah, um, yeah. I'd, I'd gone to this incredible place. Um, and none of it, and I was terrified actually. I, so I thought I'd gone crazy. And it wasn't until I was 16 that my parents actually told me what had happened to me. And so I had five years of 
being tested for brain damage and stuff because I I was gone for quite some time, um, and it wasn't until they'd actually started to tell me what had happened that I began to be able to make a bit more sense of it myself. And then, since then, of course, I've met many many other people who've had mm. near death experiences and I researched yeah. it and read about yeah. it and um, and of course. Perhaps there's an argument that suggests I'm drawn to working in end-of-life care because of that experience myself, and yeah. I'm prepared to consider that as a as an argument. It's a strange place to be when you're sitting with someone who is dying mm. and frightened, um, yeah. having this kind of sense that, well, um, I'm not necessarily going to tell you, but in my own way, I kind of know it's going to be okay. Yeah. I don't know about heaven and hell and all that stuff, mm. but I went to this incredible place. Of course, lots of, 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 of doctors will argue that this was, you know, a, a, a chemical reaction and all the rest okay. of it. Yeah. And that, that, that argument rages around NDEs. Yeah, it does. But, yeah. Um, yeah. And my experience of it changed my life for sure. And yeah. And still does. Yeah, and, and I mean, I've, you know, had a kind of, well, maybe not a lifelong, but I've, I mean, I've had a real interest in NDAs and, I, you know, I've done a lot of reading on it, a lot of, mm. read all sorts of things, you know, some of the medical medical arguments and, you know, et cetera, all the things that, um, that you know, you also, also know, you know, but it's, there's something about those experiences, I think, you know, they cut it, people from different cultures, you know, from different mm. religions, from, you know, it, it people from all over the world experience very very similar things you know and that is yeah. you know, of great interest you know to me um they're almost identical yeah. actually you know yeah aren't they? They you, are. know, you read the accounts one of the first things that was so helpful for me was that i was able to read a, 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 a an account or two and meet someone else and when i told this person my dream he said no 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 that's my dream yeah and in, in, everything even the colors you know, we end up at this phenomenal field and where there's a gate, a style, and the invitation to step over it and the vivid yellow. And, and, and he's going, I couldn't tell you how yellow it is. And I'm going, yeah, you could. <laughs> I was there. And it's like, wow, yeah. how can we have yeah. such almost identical experiences? But, but millions of people have. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's such a fascinating, mm. fascinating area. I mean, just yeah. kind of moving on, I, I, we're almost out of time. I just wanted to look, reading the book, there seems to be quite a lot of synchronicity going on. I don't know whether you've looked back at, you know, at your career like that, but I guess the early work with, with Jonathan, when, you know, you were, mm. you were training to be a music therapist that seemed to be a real spark that I mean you that kind of pulls you forward and also I think from memory you know Di, Diana and then mm. eventually working with somebody who had been a pupil I, I mean that's just two things but there does seem to be quite a lot of synchronicity in your life that you know as a music therapist and probably mm. arguably in your life you know outside and I just wonder it's a big question but how, how do you see that? Do you know, no one's never asked me that, but but the truth is actually that that's exactly how I see my life. Um, I don't think I make a big deal out of it, but mm. I frequently find myself reflecting that, um, oh boy, that kind of feels like that was meant to be yeah yeah you know how they say the right clients will always find you yeah that's so true as well isn't it yeah and that's the felicity, <laughs> isn't it and, yeah. and so yeah i think uh, that's happened throughout my life mm. uh, and, and i think like everyone else i've probably spent a great deal of time you know feeling thinking why is this happening <laughs> do I really want this to be happening? Oh, for goodness yeah. sake, have I really got to go through this again or whatever? Yeah. I want to change this. And then, you know, uh, with the benefit of uh, a little bit of help and, and some reflection, noticing that it was exactly what needed to happen. Um, yeah. So, yeah, maybe maybe we're all blessed. I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Jungian, you know, psychology, big subject. We won't yeah. go into that here, but you know, <laughs> but, but yeah, I think yeah, synchronicity is mm. very, very interesting. Bob, if people want to get hold of the book or, or mm-hmm. they want to contact you for therapy or, you know, you do so many things, you know, or teaching, we'll obviously put all of your links onto, you know, our, our social media platforms. But I mean, how, first of all, how do they get hold of the book? The book you can buy from Amazon. Um, you can also go and order it in bookstores, I believe. Um, Amazon is the easiest way, or, although I do know lots of people prefer not to use them. Mm. Um and the uh, you can uh, go onto my website, uh, which is Bob Heath Music, uh, www.bobheathmusic. Um, and on there, you can listen to the music in, that I write about in the book for free. And there's a link then to also some of the other things that I've written. Um, I'm not great social media, uh, so... I don't spend a lot of time on, on stuff like that. I'm, I'm actually, I'm quite hopeless. Um, I think I had Facebook. <laughs> so you, you can find me on Facebook, but I don't really do much on that either. Um, I'm always happy to email and chat and talk. And uh, yeah, so I think I'm pretty easy to contact. Uh, and I'm very happy to talk to anybody who'd like to, to talk mm-hmm. about any of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, and, and great. And then social media, you know, I'm fortunate that the creative genius behind these shows, you know, is my friend Joe, who's 30, and he's brilliant. He does all of that. Oh, gosh, I need a Joe. <laughs> well, I need you a do. Joe. Yeah, you <laughs> fantastic. And, I, and yeah. I just wanted to say, you know, I mean, again, you know, I, I thought the book was absolutely beautiful. You know, it really touched Thank me. You. I couldn't put it down. So I really would recommend that our listeners get a copy. I mean, it is really, really and beautifully written. You know, I mean, I'm not an expert on writing, but I thought it was beautifully written. Um, and do, we, we're kind of at the end now. Is there anything that, that you would like to say that we've not talked about? Um, I, I, I don't think so. It's been it's been lovely to talk uh, to you about our work. I, I suppose I've always I've always looked outside of music therapy, really, for my extended learning um and uh so i've i've always thought that the world of psychotherapy and has always been it's fascinated me and i've learned so much from looking at other disciplines and um so i suppose uh, one of the things that, that that i really like the idea of is that we share uh our skills you know uh, my supervisor who is a, a psychotherapist use so many creative ways of working um and he adored it and um uh, and so sometimes i get contacted by people who say look i i, I want to become a psychotherapist but do you think i need to train as a music therapist first and i often say well no you know you're a musician um you've become a qualified psychotherapist you may well end up sitting one day with somebody and saying come sit the piano with me and play the black notes where does that take you mm-hmm. and you know th- th- there is something about being able to share our skills that yeah. I-, I find really exciting yeah i mean I, and i absolutely agree with with that you know in creativity you know i mean kind of creativity and therapy you know it's it can be such a gateway for people to enter yeah. you know, their psyche for want of a better description, really in the deeper levels. Sure. And the, the, just the final question, you know, we ask all of our guests, it may be slightly redundant here because I guess we've talked about a lot about, you know, your love of music, but what, what are your go-to um, strategies for ensuring you retain, you know, good mental health? Um, well, music, yes, but what, what, music because I play in a little trio and I also occasionally get to still go out with my old rock and roll band and I have such fun I love making noise (laughs) (laughs) and actually yeah a band is is such a great fraternity and I can just go out and let my hair down and have fun and I find that's really good for me but I still I write lots of songs still myself and um, I also um, run I exercise yeah. So it's not unusual for me to have a particularly tough day and still get my kit on at the end of the night and just mm. even if it's just for 15 minutes, 
Yeah. I go for a run around the streets and somehow that gives me the space to process what I need to process and I just yeah. feel different from it there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, both, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on. I mean, what, what a really, really interesting show, you know, on many different and levels. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure. Good. Real pleasure. Thank really you. lovely to meet you. Yeah. Thank you, Mark.